No Coins, Please, by Gordon Corman. Chapter 1, The Ambulance. Rob Nevin looked from his friend to the application form on the table between them and back to his friend again. You're kidding. Dennis Lever grinned broadly. No, it's a great idea. From his pocket, he produced a colorful brochure and placed it in front of Rob. Here, look at this, Rob frowned. Junior tours, fun, education, an adventure wrapped up in an exciting trip your youngster will never forget. Come on, you want us to be counselors on this thing? Dennis pointed to a picture of two stalwart counselors standing behind six bright-eyed young boys, all of them framed by the Grand Canyon and an immaculately blue sky. That's us in a few weeks. But Dennis will have kids to take care of. We don't know anything about kids, Dennis shrugged. What's not to know? You just drive them around and make sure they don't get themselves killed. That's all there is to it. And we get an all-expense-paid trip to, from Montreal to Los Angeles in our own van. We even get paid for it. Rob snorted. A thousand dollars isn't exactly what I'd call big bucks for five weeks' work. We could make a lot more than that sweeping floors or something. I've got a line on jobs as painter's assistants for us. I'm supposed to let the guy know sometime this week. Tell him no deal. We're traveling men. If we took that painting job, we'd never get out of Montreal all summer. We're going to see the world, not the inside of some Cote St. Luke living room, dining room. Besides, we'll get tips. At the end of the tour, all the grateful parents slip the counselors a little something extra. It's what they slip you at the beginning of the trip that worries me. They're kids. Here, let me read you what it says. Last year, Junior Tours fielded 100 vans, crisscrossing the continental United States on seven different routes, carrying 600 boys and girls. You hear that, Nevin? Boys and girls. That means there are female counselors. Are there any female painters? Rob hesitated. Well, not to mention all the girls will meet just as a matter of course on the trip. We'll be staying over long enough in some places to get to know people. Look at this. First stop, New York. New York, Nevin! As soon as we get the kids off to sleep, the whole city will be there at our feet. Come on, Dennis, Rob exclaimed. You'll talk, you talk like we're driving cabbages here. These are kids. They get stomach aches. They get lonely. They throw up. They cry. They wet their beds. <laughs> Don't be silly. These aren't babies. The youngsters, oh, the youngest little bee is 11. Think back to when you were 11. You didn't do any of those things. 11-year-olds are men. He laughed delightedly. The whole thing is fantastic, so fantastic it almost makes me wonder if there's a catch. According to this brochure, said Rob sourly, there are six catches per van. Dennis, come on, take the painting job with me. And this is a golden opportunity too, because they've never had any Canadian kids on the tour before. We'll be ambassadors of goodwill. We'll be nursemaids. I told you, these kids are men. Here, the application's all filled out except for your signature. Um, I took the liberty of adding a few years' experience in a daycare center to your life. A little dishonest, maybe, but we don't want to miss out on this. Oh, what did you put on your own resume? You're a well-known pediatrician, I suppose? Just a few years as a camp counselor, Dennis grinned smugly. Or a cinch. Rob leapt to his feet. I wouldn't get involved in this thing if there was no painter's job and I had to spend the summer lying on the cedar deck, rotting and fighting with the mosquitoes for my own blood. You're crazy. Dennis looked concerned. You know, if we don't get our applications in on time, we might not make it. Forget it, Dennis. No way. Through the Montreal traffic, moved a shiny white van. The flashy JT Junior Tours logo splashed in red and yellow on its side. 
It jerked and balked as it turned a corner. Ah, Nevin, my boy, you'll never regret this, said Dennis, shifting gears. Loud screeches of protest issued from the engine. This is going to be the trip of a lifetime. I can tell, said Rob sourly, jamming his baseball cap further down over his curly black hair. Can't you manage a smoother ride, or are we going to bounce all the way to California? I'm getting the hang of it, said Dennis cheerfully. I just can't wait to meet the guys, <laughs> Rob moaned. His protests and refusals had all come to nothing. Withering under the fire of his best friend's enthusiasm, he had cracked under the promise of the open road, city lights, the great outdoors, the California sun, and hordes of beautiful women. He hated himself for it, but he had traded his paintbrush for a clipboard with six names and addresses on it, his charges to be. With a grinding of gears, they rounded a corner and pulled to a halt in front of the first house on the list. Dennis took an instant liking to Sheldon, greeting him like a long-lost son and jabbering ecstatically about the wonderful time in store. Sheldon, however, didn't appear to be paying attention. He kept his mournful brown eyes trained on his shoelaces and his conversation restricted to yes and no answers. His mind was obviously elsewhere, but this didn't seem to bother Dennis. For his part, Rob was friendly and tried to look responsibly optimistic about the trip. With Sheldon and his gear loaded into the van, they proceeded to the next address to pick up Howie, a tall, thin, blonde boy with glasses and an endearing, slightly goofy smile. Howie, Rob reflected, was the sort of person who would go through life being liked, and Dennis, of course, was duly impressed. The next stop added Nick to the roster. Nick seemed very excited about the trip, but he didn't feel up to facing the open road without his rabbit's foot. This sparked a lively debate between the boy and his parents, in which Dennis acted as self-appointed mediator, until it was finally agreed that the rabbit's foot could go. Nick, his round face beaming, was then loaded into the van under Dennis's approving eye. Kevin, next on the list, was a dark boy, small for his age. He was all business, though, and paid almost no attention to his mother, but kept himself occupied with directing Dennis and Rob in the loading and placement of his camera equipment. A large tripod, a camera bag, two cases of lenses and filters, and an enormous duffel bag marked film accompanied his small suitcase of clothing. Only when the packing was done to his satisfaction did he exchange a fond farewell with his anxious mother and the group headed on. Next came Sam, who looked like the perfect kid, clear-eyed, dark-haired, and athletic. He seemed ready to take on the world with a devil-may-care style, which he had long worked on. He suffered a temporary loss of image when his mother kissed him goodbye, but with help from Dennis, he managed to carry it off rather well. By this point, Dennis's enchantment with his group had grown almost to the point of rapture. We are definitely the luckiest counselors on the whole tour, he yodeled gleefully as they made their way toward the last address on the list. You guys just get acquainted with each other. We've got one more pickup than on to New York. There was restrained cheering from the five, which Rob interpreted as excitement over the trip mixed with misgivings about leaving home. The final stop was a large, attractive brick house in the heart of suburbia. Hi, Mrs. Geller, Dennis greeted the woman who answered the door. I'm Dennis from Junior Tours, and this is my partner, Rob. We've come to pick up Arthur. She ushered them into the front hall, and Rob watched his friend's eyes for the look of loving welcome signifying that Arthur measured up to the perfection of the five they had left waiting in the van. Artie, the van is here. Mrs. Geller disappeared for a moment and returned with a slim, dark boy dressed much as the others had been in jeans and a t-shirt, except that around his neck he wore a small leather pouch suspended on a stout string. Over his shoulder was a slung a large duffel bag, and in his right hand he carried a black leather attaché case with the letter A engraved on the lock. Dennis chortled with delight. Hi there, Artie. All ready to go, I see. I'm Dennis and this is Rob. Have you packed everything on the checklist, Mrs. Geller? Rob asked politely. Oh, yes. And Artie has spending money, Dennis prompted. <laughs> she flushed slightly. Well, he has a few dollars. It's enough. 
Dennis's earnest face grew grave. Well, the tour's recommendation is $200, and the other boys have at least that much. We wouldn't want Artie to be left out of anything, <laughs> Mrs. Geller hesitated. Well, sometimes it's not such a good idea to let Artie have too much money because... Oh, I see, Dennis smiled knowingly. Don't worry, we won't let him spend it foolishly, she sighed. Well, I suppose $200 isn't too much money if you hold it for him. You will watch him very closely, won't you? Scout's honor, Dennis beamed, accepting the crisp bills. All right, Artie, let's hit the road. Dennis grabbed Artie's duffel bag and Rob reached for the attache case. Oh, I can carry this, said Artie casually. He turned to his mother. Goodbye, Mom. All right. She kissed him soundly on the cheek. You'll be good, like you promised Dad and me? Artie nodded. Don't worry, Mrs. Geller, said Dennis. Artie will be just fine. Be good, she repeated, and continued to call out the same two words as she stood on the front lawn, watching the van pull away. Your mom seems a little nervous, Rob commented. Oh, it's okay, said Artie in his soft voice. She's just a little overprotective. All right, guys, this is just great, Dennis raved. We're going to be the best group junior tours ever had. There was dead silence. Rob looked back. Uh, Dennis, he whispered. I hate to tell you this, but three of your men are crying. Dennis glanced in the rearview mirror. Sheldon, Kevin, and Nick were all in tears, and Howie wore a long, forlorn face. Ah, uh, come on, guys, don't be sad. I know it's kind of a drag to be away from home for the first time, but we're going to have a ball together, right, Rob? Sure, said Rob with as much conviction as he could muster. Besides, we've got a lot of important business to take care of before we get to New York. Dennis went on. We need a name for our van. It has to be a great name, too, because that's what we're going to be called when all the different groups meet up at the checkpoints along the way. Maybe we should be something fearsome like the monsters. Someone in the back seat honked into their handkerchief. Not so good, eh? said Dennis. Well, what do you guys think? Sheldon perked up. I saw a movie once where the heroes named his van Old Betsy. Are you nuts, cried Sam. Do you want to, to jog onto a soccer field while they announce us as Betsy? Kevin looked thoughtful. Well, we're traveling around a lot, so why don't we call ourselves the Rovers? Forget it, said Howie. That's what you call a dog. I know, said Nick. We'll be the horseshoes for luck. How about you, Artie? Piped Dennis. Any ideas? Artie, sitting with his attache case on his lap, shrugged casually. Whatever you guys come up with will be just fine, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, said Dennis. These are all great suggestions, but I kind of pictured something a little more unique, you know. Something that reflects the van, like a white lightning or a white tornado. <laughs> Rob laughed mirthlessly. White lightning? If you want a good name for a white van, try the ambulance. A big cheer went up from the back. Perfect, exclaimed Sam. The ambulance. I love it, Nick decided. Aw, come on, guys, Dennis protested. You don't want to be the ambulance. It's silly. We can have a group yell, exclaimed Kevin. He opened his mouth and emitted the piercing scream of an ambulance siren. Sam and Nick joined in with enthusiasm. We've got the best name on the whole tour, crowed Howie. Thanks, Rob. Don't mention it, Rob grinned, enjoying the look of dismay on Dennis's face. But guys, not the ambulance. Oh, yes, it's perfect, said Sam with great authority. Everyone else is going to have a boring name like the Wanderers. How unoriginal, said Howie, nodding wisely. The ambulance is, you know, creative, said Sam. We'll be one of a kind. Way to go, Nevin, muttered Dennis bitterly. We've got the dumbest name on the whole tour, and it's all your fault. <laughs> Rob shrugged, grinning. You wanted to be unique. As the day's driving progressed and the boys chatted among themselves and with their counselors, one thing became apparent to Rob. Sheldon could fill in any space in a conversation and was more than willing to do so. My best friend in the world is Pete Ogrednik. He was saying, The Ogredniks live around the corner on Elm Street right next to the plaza with the bake shop where Pete and I used to go for chocolate fudge cookies. They were so good I can almost taste them now. 
Rolf glanced back to see that the other five boys had tuned Sheldon out and were absently looking absently out the windows. Dennis was not listening either, although he was trying to appear attentive by nodding his head in intervals and uttering the occasional, "Uh uh-huh. Pete's 21 now. He was 10 when I was born, but that never stopped him from being my friend. He even tried to teach me to ride a bike. He put in a lot of time before we gave up. Pete says I'm uncoordinated, but he says it with love. Shelton's face turned tragic. I'll bet he can't get those great fudge cookies in Helsinki. Pete moved away, did he? Said Rob, almost comatose. Yeah, all the way to Finland. He's working at the shipyards there, installing telephones on this new cruise ship. The Lady Jane. Pete says the Lady Jane has 167 telephones. Pete's the greatest guy in the world. I think I have to go to the bathroom, announced Kevin. Yeah, I think we could all use a pit stop, Dennis agreed. We'll pull in at the next service station. Sheldon was still talking, not missing a beat. Pete and I had some great times together. I'll never forget the time we... The white van was at rest in a trailer camp just north of New York City. The canvas shelter concealed in its roof had been pulled out and down, and the six boys lay sleeping in their bedrolls on the ground sheet under it. The day's driving had ended well after dark, and they had checked into the camp in order to give the boys a good night's sleep before the big junior tour's opening meeting in Central Park the next morning. The two counselors, however, were still awake after midnight, seated at a picnic table, examining a small slip of paper by flashlight. I still say we should plead not guilty, said Dennis peevishly. There's no way I was driving 67 miles an hour. How can we plead not guilty? We can't come back from wherever we are to appear in court in upstate New York. We have to plead guilty and pay the fine. Dennis looked disgusted. This is justice? He filled in the traffic citation, added the radar must have been defective, and signed it. We can mail it tomorrow. Just be grateful the officer believed us about not being able to hear his siren because of the group yell. It's a good thing he took gave chase off his report or we'd be in jail right now. Don't blame our guys, said Dennis protectively, addressing and sealing the envelope. That whole thing's your fault anyway. The ambulance? He affixed a stamp. You know, Junior Torres is going to be really upset about having to pay this ticket. Why should they have to pay it? Rob demanded. You were driving. Dennis dealt him a withering glare, which lost some of its bite because of the dim light. You, the genius, have just explained that we're going to be on the road. Where will they be able to reach me except at the Junior Torres office? Excuse me, said Rob. Dennis put the, put the envelope in his pocket and stretched. You know, he said reflectively, if we didn't have such a great time ahead of us, this could have been a really lousy day. Well, I'm not going to little, let a little speeding ticket ruin my vacation. And tomorrow morning, I'll talk the guys out of this ambulance bit and everything will be cool. Didn't we get a great bunch of kids? They're okay, I suppose. Not exactly what I'd call men, though. I'm not so thrilled with the idea that when we got Sheldon, we also got saddled with the ghost of Pete Ogrednik. Pete says, Pete says, I hate the guy and I've never even met him. If we have to listen to Ogrednik lore all the way to California, I'm not going to be happy. Sheldon's okay, said Dennis, and that already kind of worries me. His mother seemed awfully concerned about him being good. I think that means he's usually bad. Nevin, you amaze me. Can't you see that Artie is the most harmless kid in the world? He said himself his mother was overproductive. That's the whole problem. Obviously, he's been overpowered by his family for so long that he doesn't even have a word to say for himself. That's why it's our responsibility as his counselors to bring him out of his shell and let him develop an identity and a sense of self-esteem. This trip is going to be the turning point of his whole life. Okay, Professor, said Rob. Does your psychoanalysis explain that briefcase of his? The one he takes to the bathroom and is presently sleeping with? And how about the leather pouch around his neck? 
He's probably got a good luck piece in there, said Dennis. And the briefcase is maybe just a little quirk. Don't worry. When we get through with him, Artie will be a new man. Rob frowned. So I suppose both our lives are now dedicated to the rehabilitation of Artie Geller. <laughs> Dennis grinned knowingly. I know what you're getting at. Don't panic. Tomorrow morning in Central Park, we get our first chance to scout out the female half of the store. There'll be plenty of time in the next few weeks for both the kids and the ladies.